God, it is amazing. Lord, it is so much more than, than we can even conceive of. And Lord, yet you, you extend it to us, though it's not something that we could have ever earned on our own, that unmerited favor that you so freely extend to us. God, we need your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that despite our shortcomings, our failures, the wrong things that we've done, the poor choices that we have made, despite even the fact, Lord, that we have perhaps even shunned you at different points in our lives, yet, Lord, you continue to extend that grace to us. Thank you, Lord, for not only a reminder tonight about your grace and the power of that grace to wash over all wrong in our lives. But thank you, Lord, for a fresh outpouring of that grace upon us tonight. And Lord, we say to you, we need it, Lord. We want to receive it. We don't want it to end, Lord, with this powerful time of worship. We want it to continue, Lord. And Lord, let us be quick to come to you. Let us be quick, Lord, to come back to the one from whom all good blessings come. For Lord, you indeed have exactly what we need. And so Lord, we commit our hearts to you, our minds to you once again tonight. And we look forward with new, with renewed expectation, anticipation, Lord, and hope that is made possible because of your grace. We look forward to the things that you have in store for us, Lord. We know that they are good. For you are only good. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes. So be it. That's what that word means. So all the things that we just sang, all the words that we... Uh, trying to think of a synonym for saying <laughs> all the things that we just sang all the words we just sang we say so be it lord let it be let your will be done let it be true in and through our lives amen amen you may be seated uh, my name is josh Engelhart, and i am one of the pastors here at the coastlands my wife um, jesse and i have been around here for a little while now so about 15 or so 16 years actually she's been here a lot longer than i have she grew up in the church but uh wow what a great reminder of God's goodness. And I'm so thankful, so grateful for what he spoke to us tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to what he has in store for us the rest of this evening. The ushers are going to come just now and, and pass the, the baskets for the tithes and offerings. And what I would say first about this is that if you're a guest with us, please leave your, your money in your pocket, in your wallet. Um, this is a time for those of us who call this place our church home, um, an opportunity for us to give and and to give, you know, according to the pattern in Scripture, to give our, our 10% and to give our, off, our additional offerings if, if we feel prompted by him to do so. You guys can go ahead and come forward. Um, I, it was really interesting. I, I have a Bible app in my phone, which I'm sure probably many of us do. And, and uh, there's a verse of the day that comes each day. And this morning, the first thing I looked at when I, when I turned on my phone <laughs> and, and um, looked at the... I, that's what I like to do the first thing in the morning is just to see what's the verse for the day. And it was, it's Malachi 3.10, which is very, very interesting. It has, to do with, um, it has to do with the tithe. The tithe is 10%. And back in the day, the prophet Malachi was speaking to God's people and, and saying, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, says the Lord God Almighty. And at, at that time, the, 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 the tithe I and mean, what they're actually bringing in was food from their crops, you know, from the harvest that they were, that they were reaping. And it's very interesting. It, it, you know, he's talking about the, Lord's, the Lord says through the prophet Malachi, bring this into the house. Bring this into the storehouse. Bring the food in so that there will be food. And I think that we can, we can expand that a little bit to just, for, for that word food to really mean provision, God's provision in, in, in whatever way he wants to bring it. That was, their, that was essentially their financial, um, their financial income was their, was their produce, was their harvests. But I think also that 
Well, first of all, there is the, the, the reality today that when we think of the word tithe, we're thinking about our money, and generally speaking, that's how we, we recognize and how we acknowledge, God, you first gave all, everything that I have belongs, or that came from you and really belongs to you, so I give back my 10%. And the verse goes on to say, after, the, uh, after we read that, you know, he, the Lord instructs his people to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And, and by the way, before I finish the rest of the verse, I want to say that when we read these instructions and, and these things that God asks us to do in his word, um, it's important that we keep in mind his heart for us and also other verses that we might read elsewhere. Like, I believe, it, I believe it's in uh, 1 John, somewhere in the New Testament, <laughs> where, where it says, uh, and the commands of the Lord are not burdensome. So anytime we feel burdened down or overwhelmed by something that we are doing that we think is what God is asking us to do, there's something else that has gotten in there that God hasn't put on us. It's an invitation that he gives us to participate in his kingdom and to do the things that he calls us to do. But it, the verse goes on to say, so bring, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and it, it goes on to say, and see if I won't throw open the doors of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't be room to store it. And I am not in any way trying to, you know, pat myself on the back because I can think of many, many things that I have not done right over the years. But one of the things that I am so grateful for is from the very beginning when I first came to this church, someone taught me about this principle of tithing, and I just began to do it. And there have been times when I've kind of thought about that 10% and thought, man, I sure would like to have that right now. But I have seen in, over the years, um, I have seen the way that God has continued to bless me and provide for me, for my wife, for our kids. And I believe, and, and not only that, but also I have felt a, a, a real freedom from just the anxiety that, that money can produce. I'm not saying I'm never anxious, never, never have concerns or worries, but that money has such a power to it. And when we, when we make that statement to the Lord, God, you, this came from you first and foremost, and so I want to give back that 10%. It has so much, that, just that act of obedience has so much power to really release us from the stranglehold that, that, that money can sometimes have in our lives. So I'd encourage you, if you're, whether you're, you're, you're newer to our family, um, but have decided that this is your home, or whether you're, you've been around for a long time and perhaps you've, maybe, we just, maybe you just need a fresh reminder. Yeah, the Lord, the Lord is promising provision and blessing as we take steps of obedience. And if you're someone who, who again, who is, who does call this place your church home, but you haven't begun that pattern, I encourage you to really tr to try it and see if the Lord won't give you blessing beyond what you thought that he you, was possible. Um, amen. Amen. So uh, anyways, you have, so, <laughs> off, on, on to the announcements in your bulletin, you have a lot of information that's uh, in your bulletin. So a lot of things happening around here. Um, tonight is the last night, ladies, for you to sign up for the women's advance. And um, I just encourage you, if money's a, a consideration, speaking of money, please talk to the ladies at the table. I believe there are some uh, partial scholarships available. Um, we would never want anybody to not be able to go because of uh, money, because money was, uh, was short. Uh, it's gonna be a great time for you to be together with each other and learn more about who you are in the Lord, who he's made you to be. Uh, we just don't have the ability to see in ourselves, by ourselves, all the things that are true of us. We're pretty good at pointing out faults in others and in ourselves, <laughs> right? Or at least I am. I won't put you into that. I won't assume. I won't presume upon you. But um, but it can be really difficult without a mirror, for example, to see what you look like. And so the mirror of God's word, the mirror of fellowship, being together, you, ladies, you're going to find out a lot of great things. I think about who you are and who the Lord's made you to be. Um, so last night to sign up for that. There's also another event that costs money coming up, and that's junior high, uh, junior and senior high camp. When I first saw this little, um, this little insert, I thought these were like clouds or smoke in the background, but I think they're actually chocolate chip cookies. That's very appropriate because <laughs> there is a bake sale happening tonight, and it is in the, does anybody see it? It's in the foyer? It's in the foyer, which is the room right behind us. So please buy some cookies and whatever else the, the, the youth have back there. Our um, seventh through 12th graders are going to camp and they, it's expensive and we want to send them because these are times that can be really life-changing for them. Um, also, you have a, an insert in your bulletin about a, the Philippine mission team. And what jumps out at me is that the trip ends on February 1st, which is tomorrow. So they might even be on their way back. The Philippines are a long ways away, and there's a lot of flying that happens. What's not on your insert is that this coming Friday, 
one week from last night here in the foyer. At 7 o'clock, there's a mission reception. And that's just a great time to listen to these ladies talk about what God did in and through them, how they overcame hurdles, how they, you know, had some crazy flying, you know, travel experience, um, you know, how they saw God meet them as they stepped out in faith to do things that they maybe had not anticipated uh, or not thought that they would be able to do. So consider um, attending that and supporting and celebrating what the Lord has done um, in and through those ladies on, the, on this mission trip. Do, 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 do. Last night tonight, for you who are parents of elementary age kids, last night to turn in your coins for the Plenty Express. And you will, the kids can earn double coins tonight to redeem and buy it, pick up some cool gifts down there, down, just down the, the hallway. The Lord is always up to doing new things, and um, I'm so excited about what Prisca Martinez is doing um, and what God is speaking to her about on behalf of our kids. And it's, it was great when my wife, Jessie, was, was overseeing children's ministry. Of course, I'm one of her biggest fans. But um, <laughs> lots of really fun things happened then. But God is doing a new thing. And so tonight's your last opportunity for your kids to get uh, prizes from the Plenty Express depot or booth or whatever you call it down the hallway there. <laughs> All right. I think uh, with, with that, I'll invite you to stand and get to know the people around you for just a few minutes. And we'll get on to a Bible study. everybody as you find your seats if you could open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 22 Luke chapter 22 we've been studying for a few weeks the subject of Peter's life and uh, I think you might be able to tell I feel like I can really relate to this guy and um, maybe you have uh, felt that way as well. He's a gung-ho, go-for-it dude, and Jesus really likes that. Jesus really loves it when we put ourselves out there to be known and loved uh, as the women's advance theme, uh, that, that theme that's there, known and loved. And um, I thought it was very appropriate. Colin and I didn't sync our sense of what God wanted to say to us through this service, but the theme throughout worship, that emphasis on grace culminating with the song Amazing Grace. And, uh, you know, grace is a fantastic concept. It's the idea that God wants to do good in your life, not as a reward for good behavior. 
that he wants to just bless your socks off, not because you're such a goody two-shoes, but because he just loves you, irregardless of whether you're good or whether you're not so good, whether you're performing well, as you would say, you know, how am I doing? Well, I don't know. you know, we all have a kind of an up and down response to that question. But God's response and his desire toward you and I all the time is, I just want to bless them. I want to bless them. I want to bless them. And, you know, it's, it's precisely when we're at our worst that we can finally understand just how amazing grace is. As long as we have some shred of dignity left, grace is a nice concept, but it's not necessarily amazing because we still have some leg to stand on. We still can imagine at some level that this blessing, this favor that's coming my direction is in some response, in some way a response to what I've done well. But when we've done everything wrong, when we're at the bottom of the pit, and we sense God's favor, his blessing, his acceptance, his compassion, his understanding of how we got into the mess that we were in. And even though we ourselves feel like, how did I get here? Jesus would look at us and say, I know exactly how you got to where you're at. And not only do I understand where you're at, I know the way out. So come on, you're not disqualified. Let's go. I've got a future and I've got a hope for you. And it's at moments like this, where we realize this is amazing grace. And we're going to read uh, in Peter's life of just such a moment and the process that Jesus took him through. So if you would, look with me in Luke chapter 22. We'll start reading in verses 31 to 34. This is in the midst of the Last Supper as the... uh, as the disciples have just finished up an argument about who is greatest among them. They're bickering. I don't know exactly why. We don't, get the, we don't get the context as to why it was that they were arguing, what provoked the argument. But they'd been arguing about who ought to uh, be seen as the foremost disciple among them. And Jesus addresses Peter immediately following this argument. And he says, Simon, Simon which tells me that perhaps Peter, although we don't get the context of exactly who was saying what in the argument, the fact that he immediately addresses Peter after the argument tells me that perhaps Peter might have played, had some contribution uh, toward this argument uh, as to who was greatest. But that is a bit of conjecture. In any event, we'll continue reading. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So um, Jesus is, is saying that there's been some kind of arrangement in the spiritual dimension where in response to Peter's arrogance, God has allowed Satan to essentially what he says, sift him. It's, it's reminiscent of this uh, passage in Job, at the beginning of Job, where you get this picture of some sort of an arrangement that God allows with the enemy, where the enemy says, I want to just uh, rail on this guy, but God gives him certain per- parameters. And God's ultimate goal is not for the enemy to take advantage of and abuse, uh, abuse Job, but to purify Job's faith. And uh, that's a remarkable story and a remarkable teaching of it itself. But it's a similar kind of a moment here where God allows Satan to mess with Peter's heart and mess with Peter's mind. But God has the ultimate purpose in it of purifying Peter's motives, purifying Peter's heart, purifying Peter's love to the point where he will, at the end of the process, being able to strengthen other people rather than compete with them. Remember, he's just finished arguing. He's, he's got this rivalistic drivenness to prove that he is better than them and they are likewise uh, fighting and, and, and competing and comparing. We like to imagine that we don't do this, don't we? Uh, we think we're above such things, and yet how often do we feel inferior to others and, and feel like, well, who do they think that they are to say or do this or that? And, and we can end up pitting ourselves against and measuring ourselves against and feeling like we're disqualified or feeling like they're more qualified, and we can uh, end up in this position where everything in our life is driven by where do I stack up against other people. 
And uh, Jesus wants to free us from this by helping us understand where we stack up with him. It's a really good message. There's a lot of hope there. Uh, But it really does take going to some deep places to take our eyes off of our own standing against other people and really to set our eyes on the Lord and how much he loves us. So then Peter says in response to this challenge where Jesus is saying, hey, Satan's going to sift you, but I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you that you won't fail. See, Peter thinks his strength is resident within himself, but Jesus says, no, you're going to survive this because I've prayed for you. Your strength, the source of your strength is my prayers, not your, you know, impressiveness. But Peter doesn't buy it. He says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you uh, both to prison and to death. (laughs) He's like, yeah, right, Jesus. You're not giving me credit here. You don't understand. You're selling me a bit short. But Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you, deny, uh, until you deny three times that you know me. Now let's skip down to the passage where that actually happens. Uh, continuing on in the chapter, picking it up in verse 54. Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together... Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Let's back up from the specifics of this story and try to get some context for how did Peter end up in this position of ultimately denying Jesus? What was the setup? What was the, how did he get to this point of frustration where he would say, forget it, this Jesus, I don't know him. Because it's so out of sync, it's so out of character with what we normally would see of Peter who is bold and brash and ready to say, he is the Messiah, I'll go with him to death. How does he, how does he end up in this point? Um, I want to admit before I dive into some of these specifics, I don't actually know. The text doesn't give a lot of insight into Peter's emotional state in these various situations. So as I highlight some of these details and think how could he have ended up in such a state, I want to be fair and upfront at the beginning. I'm using to some degree some imagination to fill in the details. And I want to acknowledge that when you read Scripture, um, you have to be careful doing that, (laughs) you know, because you can get yourself into trouble reading the Bible with too much imagination. (laughs) It's a pretty literal document. What it says is what it means, and so it's good primarily to stay within the text. However, there are times where the Lord, where as you put yourself into the story, and imagine, what, what, was, what would I be feeling? What would I be going through? The Lord can speak to you. And this is one of my favorite ways, actually, to read Scripture, is not just to read it as, as, a, as a documentation of historical events. Wow, that happened, that happened, and that happened. But more to insert myself into the story as various characters and think, how do I relate with their responses and their reactions? And where have I seen myself go through similar situations, and how is what Jesus spoke to them then maybe more, more deeply apply to my personal situation because I can, I can relate with what's going on. Does that make sense? So uh, just a few details. We're not going to turn to all of these things. I, I noticed at the beginning of this day, the day starts out with Jesus sending specifically, it says in Luke, that he sent Peter and John, the two of them, to go make the preparations for the Passover meal, the last supper that they were just, that they were in the process of eating. 
Now, for those of us who are not part of the Jewish context, we might not realize, but that is a meticulous and laborious process. Not only securing the venue, but cooking the, slaughtering the lamb, cooking the lamb, chopping the things. You know, it's, it's, it's like Thanksgiving with two dudes are going to like prepare the whole thing. And I think he purposefully uh, chose Peter and John. It's a role of humble service to spend all day in the sweaty kitchen preparing this meal. Now, again, we don't know the specifics of what was Peter's emotional response to, to Jesus' selection of him to do essentially the dirty work. But we do know that when Jesus came in to receive the meal, his first thing that he did was to teach them about the value of humble service. Does this make sense? I wonder if part of his reason for giving that lesson was that it was needed <laughs> because perhaps that task was not undertaken with total gratitude and cheerfulness. The seeds of despair. This is unfair. Why, why me? And specifically, when life throws at us the opportunity to serve, which there are many, and they will come at us whether we feel ready for them or not. <laughs> whether it's a parent who, as I was just walking down the hall, I overheard a daddy saying, she just dropped a deuce. You know, he was just, I could just feel the, oh, it was just right down here in the hallway, and I could just feel him. Oh, we just made it to church. I was just about to hand her over, and She's still in my arms. No! <laughs> Life presented this young dad with an opportunity to serve. And it, it can grind against us. It can say, how could this happen? This isn't fair. This isn't right. But Jesus wants to offer us these opportunities where we see the incredible blessing and the incredible honor. I remember when someone coached me on my attitude with challenges with my own kids, and they said, Todd, remember, you'll never, ever get to change their diaper again. This is it. You have two and a half years. And after that, you'll never get to do it again. And just that shift of understanding, that shift of language, that this is a privilege, this is a precious time of intimacy and opportunity for me to get down at a very intimate level and, and serve my children. What a, what, a, what a foundation of relationship that God's given me this opportunity to serve them and, and, and to be freed myself from the thought that I might somehow be above such humble service. Oh, man, I want the joy of being a daddy. But being the joy of being a daddy comes with a lot of pain in the rear. Does this make sense? And if I grind against that rather than celebrating the delight and the joy that when Jesus gives me an opportunity to serve, this is the highest privilege. Jesus, you came into the world not to be served, but to serve. And God, I want to get in on the freedom and the joy that you lived with because you didn't come hanging on to your life seeking to get people to recognize you and serve you. You came with such joy and with, with such freedom and with such life. I want every moment that I'm given to just give my life away, to be a moment that I get to realize this is a moment given to me by Jesus where I get to walk in the footsteps that he laid in front of me. Thank you, Lord, that you are giving me this opportunity to walk in the freedom that you yourself walked in where I give my life away. And I'm empowered to do that because you first gave your life to me. What a joy and an honor that I get to now give my life to others. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. But that is, I would say, a challenging perspective <laughs> to hold on to in the midst of what life throws at us. All right, continuing on, uh, in, in the Last Supper, and the details are given here in Luke 22, and it's in, it's in each of the Gospels, has, picks up little different details, but it's interesting because you can actually reconstruct from the details given in the different Gospels uh, a partial seating arrangement for the evening. Uh, the detail is given that John was leaning against Jesus and was able to lean over and ask him a private question that no one, able, no one else was able to hear. So we know with confidence that John was sitting next to Jesus. Interestingly, the detail is given in Matthew that Judas was able to do the same thing. He was able to lean over when Jesus predicted the very first thing of the dinner was that Jesus predicted that someone at the table would betray him. And it's only in the book of Matthew that the detail is given, but it says that Judas essentially whispered to Jesus and said, is it me? 
without anybody else having heard the question, and Jesus is able to respond to him. So knowing that, Jesus, that Judas and Jesus were able to have a similarly close interaction that didn't allow others to hear, we can guess with some confidence that John might have been on one side and Judas would have been the other. The only person that we know who was probably further away than they would have wanted to be from the p place of honor that would be next to Jesus. See, in our culture and party settings, maybe you've been a host who struggled a bit with where should I have people sit well it's nothing in American culture compared to Jewish culture the seating arrangement was everything everyone noticed and it was everything and John and Peter is the one who's referenced as not being able to have that kind of intimate interaction with Jesus he has to kind of lean over and ask John to ask Jesus a question during dinner does that make sense and interesting again it's somewhat hypothetical but I wonder to what degree after spending a long day during the, doing the hard work of preparing dinner, to now see that the place that he would normally occupy, as is related in all the other gospel stories, it's almost always Peter, James, and John with closest intimacy to Jesus, and now to see someone else after this long day of work now usurping the place that's normally his, I just wonder if that kind of was also grinding on him, grinding on him, grinding on him. Ugh, ugh, this isn't right, that's my seat. <laughs> Then when it comes to Jesus washing the disciples' feet, you know, Peter resists, and we all know that wasn't good because Jesus corrects him, right? But I think we read maybe too quickly because there's a part of his resistance of Jesus' washing his feet that I think is righteously motivated. When I read it, I, I read similarly to how John the Baptist resisted uh, baptizing Jesus. There's a part of this where Peter's like, this isn't right. I mean, just a couple weeks ago, I saw you on top of the mountain shining with the glory of God, your transfigured glory. This is not right that God in a human body would be down digging the dirt from between our toes. He's wanting to preserve the Messiah's dignity. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is not right. So there's a, there's a righteous, from my perspective, a righteous element to Peter's complaint. In the same way that John the Baptist's complaint was righteous. But we all know there was something else going on as well. There was comparison. Because the story says that Jesus washed several other of the disciples' feet first before he came to Peter. And again, we don't get this detail actually written. But my guess is he's thinking, how could they be so rude to the Savior, to the Messiah? Does this make sense? How could they? And he's thinking, well, when he, when he gets to me, I'm not going to let him wash my feet because I'm better than them. Right? There's other stuff going on besides that. He just, he doesn't want to have a Messiah who washes feet. <laughs> That's not the Messiah that I planned for. <laughs> The Messiah that I am following here, he's the one who shows his greatness by beating all the bad guys up, <laughs> not by washing people's feet. That's no sign of greatness that I'm after. And so although when Jesus corrects them, we know that he has this instantaneous turnaround, at least in word, we also know the detail is given that Jesus says, you won't understand right now what I'm doing, but you'll understand it later. So we know that even though it, with his mouth he went along, okay, wash my whole body, we know that because Jesus said he didn't understand it, there was still some confusion, some frustration, some chafing. Why is this guy washing my feet. Surely if he had truly understood the, the episode, the rest of the evening uh, would have gone a bit differently. Okay, <clears throat> then after dinner, we read this part, uh, or maybe it's in the midst of dinner, but, but Peter is asserting his loyalty. Jesus, I'll go to death with you. I'll fight for you. I'll die for you. And Jesus corrects him. What's this guy want? <laughs> What's this guy's problem? I try to defend his dignity and he corrects me. I try to say I'm loyal and he corrects me. I'm getting a little tired of this. See, Jesus 
He wanted something so much more for Peter than to affirm what was already right about him. You know, we're all a mixed bag. The Bible says none of us are righteous, not even one. In fact, when people called Jesus great teacher, good teacher, he said, not even I'm good. <laughs> Only God is good. See, but Peter doesn't understand that. He's so convinced that I'm loyal, <laughs> I'm right. This is true. Why aren't you giving me the credit I deserve? He has his foundation built on what Jesus says in another place is really a false foundation. It's a sandy foundation. As long as our convictions, as long as our passions are built primarily on our own thoughts and our own loyalties and our own determination, I'm going to do what's right. I love God and I'm going to do it. It doesn't ultimately have that much of a of, of a place to sustain us and ultimately a place to be fruitful in the lives of others. And that's what Jesus wants. See, Jesus wants to shape Peter as he had called him into this stone, into this rock that he could build on. But as long as he's competing and comparing with the other disciples, how are those guys going to rest on him? How are those guys going to trust him? How are those guys going to open their lives to him when he's so convinced that he's better than them? But with the way his mindset works, with the way he views the world, with the way he views himself, it's very difficult to be helpful to anybody else because he's so concerned with himself. And Jesus' corrections are not intended to beat him up. Jesus' corrections are intended to release something in Peter and free him from this drivenness toward pride, towards arrogance, toward I want to prove myself. Now, in various others of us, we're not necessarily Peters who are brash and bold and defending ourselves. We're more the flip side of the coin who are like, oh no, I'm no good. I've got nothing to offer. I've got nothing to say. And we disqualify ourselves. But those are two sides of the same coin. If I'm saying I'm so great because I have so much to offer, that's a form of pride because it's, my confidence is in myself and in my assessment of myself. In the same way, if I think I'm so terrible that I have nothing to offer, it's ultimately an accusation of God that He can't do anything with me and that He made some mistake when He made me, and still my confidence is in myself and in my assessment of what I have to offer. Does this make sense? Pride and shame are really just two sides of the same coin. So regardless of whether you feel like you're a brash, assertive person or whether you're a mousy kind of hide in the corner kind of a person, we can all relate with Peter <laughs> because this is the brokenness of our human condition is that we tend to compare and compete with one another as happens again and again in the, in the Gospels. And that's what Jesus is primarily correcting Peter through, for, through throughout this episode is bringing him to that place where he can come to that humble dependence on the goodness and the grace of God and, and, and be totally totally, 100% completely free from the judgments and expectations that he would put on himself or that he would feel that he would need to live up to from others, that he could know that he knows that he is affirmed by Jesus, that he is loved by God, that he was made with a purpose and a destiny, and his calling is to live that destiny out because God loves me, and I want to live for the one who loves me this much. I don't want to live for myself to prove my own worth. I want to live for the sake of the one who died for me. So Jesus' corrections are not because he's trying to beat this guy up or because there isn't some shred of righteousness in his assertions. It's just that it's a mixed bag and God, Jesus wants to bulldoze the mixed bag and give him a firm foundation and a pure heart that's so focused on God's goodness that he could forget completely about his own and really use his life for the sake of coming under other people to lift them up instead of constantly trying to compare himself to try to get himself lifted up. <clears throat> so, so, G, so Peter asserts his, his loyalty, Jesus corrects him. Then they go off into the Garden of Gethsemane and all the disciples fall asleep. Jesus asks them to stay awake and to watch and to guard, and they're all When Jesus comes back, he picks out Peter and says, why did you fall asleep? He doesn't address any of the other disciples. They all fall asleep, and, Jesus, and Peter gets picked out for correction. Once again, 
What is up with you, Jesus? What is your problem? What do you expect of me here? And what he doesn't understand is how Jesus is seeking to prepare him for the promotion of being this rock that the church will be built on. See, as long again as Peter's foundation is built on, well, they all fell asleep too. There's nothing solid to build on in that posture. But we're going to get to see what Peter's foundation ends up being as he comes face to face with his own failure. It comes to a head when Judas comes with the soldiers. Soldiers come swarming in. Judas identifies Jesus, and Peter says, all right, this is it. It's throwdown time. I've been taking all this from Jesus. I've been taking all this from the other disciples. It's time for everyone to see what's really true of me, (laughs) because they're all wimpy pants, (laughs) and I'm going to show them what's up. And he pulls out his sword, and he alone is the one to really stand up and take care of business. And then after, in his mind, he's just done the ultimate thing. This is a surely a losing fight. Surely this will lead to his death. Surely this is the final proof that really Jesus, see, (laughs) I'm willing to die with you. This was maniacal suicide maniacal i guess is the right word you know what i'm trying to say this is just i'm driven to prove myself to you and all these guys that i'm the man and so he swipes at the at the at the servant's ear and uh and then of course what happens jesus corrects him again (laughs) and i think at this point something begins to really break Uh, because then there's that insult to injury. Jesus heals the guy that he was just trying to defend him from. As they bind him up, and as they lead him away, I just have to imagine Peter like, so what was this all about? We've been fighting, we've been working, we've been praying, we've been doing all of this, and you're giving up now? (laughs) What happened to the kingdom? (laughs) What happened to everything that we were about? You're throwing in the towel? It's not me who's denying you, (laughs) it's you, Jesus, who are betraying me. And they lead him off. It says he follows from a distance. And I think he's just so wrapped up in his frustration and his anger, he doesn't even understand how much Jesus loves him, even at that point. Until, as we read just a moment ago, and it happens in verse, you know, in this this passage 54 through 62, it says that he denies Jesus. And the moment that really captures my attention is in verse 61, right after the third denial, the third betrayal that Peter offers. It says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, this word for looked that Luke uses in the Greek is not the standard word for looked. The standard word for looked means that you see something. It has to do with vision. But this particular word for looked, it actually means he saw and understood. It's the same word that he uses when it says that Jesus looked into the crowd and saw the lame person, or that he looked at the rich young ruler and loved him, or that he looked at the woman caught in adultery and felt compassion for her. It's this, he saw, but it wasn't just that he observed, it's that he understood It's the same word that John uses in John chapter 1 when it says that when, um, who was Peter's brother? Was it James, right? No, it was Andrew. Andrew brought uh, Peter to Jesus in in John chapter 1, and as he's introducing, it's actually Simon at that time, he's introducing Simon to Jesus. It says that Jesus looked at Simon and says, 
you'll no longer be called Simon, but you will be called Cephas. You'll be called Peter the Rock. And so it's that he saw him, he understood him. And I think in this moment when Peter is at the height or at the depth, I should say, of his worst moment, he catches Jesus' eye and it's nothing of what he expects to see there. Remember, Peter is just raging here like, how could this be? This is so wrong. And he expects to see disappointment. I don't know, perhaps disappointment in Jesus' eye, perhaps anger in Jesus' eye, perhaps I knew it would come to this. You know, some, some look like that, but what does he see? What does he see in Jesus' eyes? Compassion, acceptance, forgiveness, affection. And it's at that moment that he says that it says that he remembered Jesus' words and he went out and wept bitterly. And why did he weep bitterly after having just noticed Jesus' gaze? You know, prior to this point, I think throughout Peter's life, most of his self-concept had been built on, I'm better than other people. And during the life of Jesus' ministry through all the corrections, a subtle sense of he's not giving me the credit that I deserve. <laughs> and some of his courage to keep going on was built on the, I'm eventually going to prove it to Jesus and to everyone else that really I am a little better than what they all seemed to think all that time. But in that moment, Jesus' loving gaze brought all those defenses down. As long as we don't know that we're going to be accepted when our shame is brought forward, we hide it. Does that make sense? When we think that we're going to be rejected because you're just a failure, we'll try to defend and say, well, no, I'm not, and Mac anger and bitterness, and rage, and comparison, envy, all this sort of thing will, will, will manifest. But when we know that we know that we're safe, when we know that we know that we're loved, wow, I'm a failure. I'm a failure. Full Stop. I didn't love Jesus like I thought I did. I'm certainly not better than any of these other jokers. He's able to, to see it. And thankfully, that's not where the story ends. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but it is important to recognize that in order for grace to be amazing, it has to be understood at the moment of our greatest weakness. And that's what, that's what happens in this, in this particular episode. But if you would, because I don't want to end here, if you would glance with me briefly at the episode of, at, of Peter's restoration in John chapter 21. So flip over to John chapter 21. We're fast forwarding now past a couple of interactions, and we don't actually know what Jesus' interactions were with Peter in those earlier times, in those earlier uh, moments. It says this is the third time that he had met with his disciples. And so uh, we do know that when Peter sees Jesus in, in John chapter 21, the first half of the chapter, describes how when he sees Jesus, he's just so overjoyed that he leaps over the side of the boat and swims to shore to meet him. So all of that guilt, all of that shame, all of that, oh, it's, you know, this is terrible, I've really failed, that's now past. So somehow in the interactions that Peter had with Jesus prior to this episode, Jesus certainly spoke some things to Peter of affirmation and blessing because he has that joy in his heart to see Jesus and, and, and go toward him. But there's still some question that Jesus needs to answer, and that's what happens after they bring in this awesome haul of fish and Peter swims to shore, and some of us are familiar with that story, but we'll pick it up after that little episode in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, 
Son of John, do you love me more than these? And some people would, some Bible teachers have said, and I, I don't disagree, that he's referencing the fish. Do you love me more than these fish? Because at the moment of hopelessness, you know, Peter had gone back out to fishing. That could very well be. We don't actually know specifically what he was getting at. But do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now, what's happening in this episode, I think Jesus is being gentle and kind in how he's bringing up the episode of Peter's failure and his denial, right? He's being oblique by asking the question three times. It's, it's a gentle reference but it's still pretty obvious what he's getting at, right? And it's interesting that the gospel says specifically that it's after the third time that it really sinks in. And it says, Peter was grieved. Oh, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> but what's happening here? What's happening here is that Jesus is, 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 is affirming Peter. He's saying, Peter... I love you. With each time he asks him, do you love me, he's referencing the, the denials. It's a direct reference with each question. Is that really what you think you deny me or do you love me? So he's referencing it. Do you, do you deny me or do you love me? And he's giving Peter the opportunity to speak what's really true in his heart. And then how he finishes it is with each time saying, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. It's the greatest affirmation. It's what Peter longs for more than anything is to know that he's going to be used by God, that, it's, that he's not disqualified, that, that he isn't damaged goods. Is Jesus saying, with each question, remember you failed me, but I know that's not what's ultimately true of you. You love me. But guess what? That failure is not the end of the story. That failure is actually the beginning of me strengthening you at a much deeper level than you've ever known before because now whatever ministry you do in the future will not be based on your sense of how great you are. It will be based on the realization that I have overcome your failure. There was a story that had happened earlier when Jesus had restored this woman who was caught in adultery and he was interacting with the Pharisees afterward and they were so upset that Jesus would forgive a woman who was caught in sin. How could you forgive a woman caught in the act of sin? And Jesus says, well, who loves me more? And he tells a parable to highlight it, but the essence of it is he says, who loves me more, the one whom I forgive just a little bit of sin or the one who I forgive a lot of sin? And he says, the one who is forgiven little loves little. The one who is forgiven much loves much. Jesus will correct us again and again and again not to beat us up, but to help us understand, no offense, what failures we are. <laughs> Wherever we think we've got our act together, it's just a setup for a bigger fall. And Jesus wants to help us see on your own, as he said in John 15, on your own you can accomplish nothing. The only source of strength, the only source of hope, the only source of real, true, lasting life and joy and peace and love and all the other good stuff 
is me. And when you let me into the places, not of how great you are. See, Jesus, look, I'm going to be loyal to you forever. But when you let me into the places where you're hurting and broken, where you don't have your act together, that's when you have a love that can really uh, uh, be helpful. As, as Again, God, God's goal, Jesus' goal is to turn Peter into someone who can be built on, to, build, to make him into a rock that, that can be built on. In the book of 2 Peter, this is at the end of his life. It's the last few words that Peter will write. It's chapter 1, verse 9. He says, if anyone doesn't have real, heartfelt affection for other people, if you feel just like grumpy (laughs) about other people, if you just like oh man, they drive me crazy. You don't have just like love for people. And there's no shame. Welcome to the club. We've all been there. What Peter says, the problem is, is that you've forgotten how much Jesus has forgiven you. The one who doesn't have brotherly affection has forgotten his purification from his former sins. When you realize Jesus, remember when you were at your worst, you were hell on wheels. And Jesus loves, loved you and brought you out of that place. And because of he loved you at your worst, doesn't that empower you now to love other people at their worst? But as long as you're focused on, well, what's their problem? Oh, the life and the love and the power and the fruitfulness of God in my life just drains away. John said it this way, this is love, not that we loved him, but that he first loved us. Paul said it elsewhere, that that while we were yet haters of God, he died for us and gave himself to us. This is what really transforms us, and this is what was happening for Peter as Jesus was asking him this question, do you love him? It's not him grinding it in. It's giving giving Peter a fresh opportunity to affirm what's really true, I do love you, but to have that confidence not be built on my affirmation, I love you, but to have that confidence built on the the, the foundation of, Jesus, you love me, and you didn't give up on me even when I was an utter disaster. It's the fulfillment of what Jesus had said back in Luke 22. If you want to flip back there, and I'll close with this. Remember, right at the, right at the beginning of what we read, Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. See, see, Peter made it through to this point on the beach because Jesus prayed for him. It was not his own strength that got him through. It was Jesus' prayers that strengthened him. I've prayed for you that, that, your, strength, that your faith would not, may not fail, and when you have turned, in other words, when you've turned again, Don't think about yourself anymore. (laughs) When you've turned again, you won't want to think about yourself anymore. When you've turned again, you'll be freed from that because you'll be so convinced that there's not that much great to look at here. When you've turned again, you'll be so convinced of your own brokenness that you won't want to compare yourself to anybody else because you'll probably come up short. But instead of all of that, you don't even have to think about all that comparison nonsense. Instead, when you've turned again, your new mission in life, because I've loved you at the deepest place, now you are set free and empowered to go and love other people at their worst places. Amen, glory, hallelujah. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you that this is your call on our lives. And Lord, wherever we are nervous or intimidated, wherever we're backing away in a corner saying, oh man, God couldn't use me and all is lost. Lord, thank you that you view these moments of our worst despair, not as the end of the story, but as the turning point. It's the moment where you can really begin to do some deep work in our hearts and convince us that you can do something with us, not because of how great we are, but because of how great you are. 
Lord, I pray for every person in this room that you would take our eyes off of ourselves because you have taught us that there is no hope or life there. Our only hope is in you and in your shed blood. We are cleansed not by our own righteousness, but because your blood is the ultimate cleansing agent, we can be washed clean, pure and white like the driven snow. So for every person who's 